What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. Hope everyone's weekend is off to a great start. If you've been following my channel for a while, you might find today's topic a little unusual in that I typically talk about sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and other forms of genre and entertainment. But with this video, I want to come to the defense of a movie that is just getting abused on Rotten Tomatoes, the Goldfinch. The movie is based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Same Name, by Donna Tartt, a novel I should admit up front I have not read. I'm also nearly completely ignorant about fine art and antiques, two topics that are central to much of this movie's story. However, I do love movies, and I feel confident talking about The Goldfinch from that point of view. Directed by John Crowley, who's best known for the 2015 film Brooklyn, with a screenplay adaptation by Peter Strawn, who wrote the brilliant movie Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, The Goldfinch is the type of film that rarely gets made in Hollywood anymore, namely a prestige drama with a decent budget, in this case an estimated $45 million. The film boasts an impressive cast and stunning photography by Roger Deakins, and is precisely the kind of film that so many critics claim they wish to see more of, a movie for adults that's not intended to be a franchise where one can build a business model around it, including an assortment of roller coasters, t-shirts, you name it. For most of Hollywood's history from the 20s up through the 90s, big budget prestige dramas were absolutely Hollywood's bread and butter. But in the 21st century, for some reason, they've almost completely vanished because the great majority of them are now being done on TV. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand my intentions as some sort of aspiring snob because I love and adore following a lot of big movie franchises, probably more so than most people, but I don't want those to be the only option when I go to the movie theater. And yet, the same critics who bemoan the fact that multiplexes feature nothing but Harry Potter, Star Wars, DC, Marvel, etc., suddenly decided to go on a feeding frenzy and rip this movie a new asshole, almost like sharks who smell a little bit of blood in the water, and they just go to town and end up devouring some of their own friends in the process. The film's currently sitting at 25% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I think will play a huge role in completely destroying this film's theatrical run. But as I looked over some of the reviews, I noticed something funny. I realized just how inaccurate and useless Rotten Tomatoes can be when it comes to nuance. Some of these negative reviews, not all, but some, are not full-throated takedowns of the movie. A lot of these reviewers simply express some frustration about the length, or how the ending doesn't quite come together, or how too much of the novel didn't quite make it into the movie. But most users online, they're going to look at that number 25, decide the movie's a giant pile of dog shit and make other plans for the weekend. What I always try and do is steer people toward Metacritic in that the site at least tries to take into account the difference between a lukewarm review versus a more extreme negative or positive response. Thankfully, a few cooler heads have prevailed and tried to come to the movie's defense. I saw Leonard Malton pushing back on the dogpile phenomenon that's in effect, and a few others who recognize that even when a movie doesn't completely hit a home run with the source material, that we at least admire and support the ambition of directors to explore and adapt challenging material. A movie business that only makes content for the very young or the very young at heart would get heartbreakingly dull in a big hurry. The irony is that I would not have even seen this movie if not for a dear friend who loves and adores the book. And I definitely wasn't planning on discussing the movie on this channel, and I'm not even trying to make the case that the film some contender for my top 10 of the year, but there is a hell of a lot to enjoy about this movie. The plot's rather complex, but in broad strokes, The Goldfinch is a coming-of-age story about a young boy named Theo Decker who loses his mother when a bomb gives off at the Met. In the chaos of the aftermath, Theo ends up taking a priceless work of art, The Goldfinch, the last known work by an artist named Fabricius, who in a cosmic coincidence also died in an explosion. The movie's told out of sequence, and the film chronicles the many chapters of the boy's life, moving forward from his time in Nevada living with his sleazy father, to his drug-fueled adventures with a globetrotting Ukrainian expatriate, and finally, to his return to New York, where he makes a life for himself as a salesman of antique furniture, working for a man who's part mentor and part father figure. As I mentioned before, the film was shot by Roger Deakins, who will go down in history as one of the best directors of photography of the last 30 years. Years. I might prefer his work with the Coen brothers, but this film is an absolute sumptuous feast for the eyes, but what really kept my attention throughout was the cast. The movie features so many incredible performances, in particular Jeffrey Wright, who has a very good chance of converting every viewer into an aspiring antique buff. Sarah Paulson's fantastic as the very sexy and very sketchy new wife of Theo's father. Oakes Fegley has some amazing chops as the young Theo, but my favorite performance has to be that of Finn Wolfhard, who plays the young Boris, Theo's best friend from childhood. The two of them spend a lot of time consuming enough drugs and alcohol to kill a small elephant, but the movie just comes to life when they're together. I already liked Finn as a performer from his roles in Stranger Things and It Chapter One, but this was the first time that I really started to see just how good he can be when he has a role that allows him to stretch his wings creatively. Perhaps this material would have been better served as a miniseries on HBO. Right now, it seems as if the movie might be too long and too short all at once. It's kind of too short to do the book justice and really do the deep dive. The book's nearly 800 pages in length, but it's also way too long for people who'd prefer just to go see the latest roller coaster ride that's masquerading as a movie. 
Something tells me though that in a few months' time, there are going to be a lot of depressing articles discussing how the Goldfinch's commercial failure is yet another sign that these kinds of projects belong solely on the small screen and nowhere else. Right now, as we speak, there are a lot of filmmakers out there and a lot of writers out there who are trying to get the green light for their projects. And when and if this movie bombs this weekend, it's going to give a lot of producers and a lot of investors really cold feet about adapting literature in the future. So that's my take on a movie that I wasn't planning on seeing or reviewing, but having seen it, I have to say that the critical community has not treated the film fairly. If you like the trailer or you're intrigued by the film, definitely see it. Because in the end, voting with your dollars is the only way to get Hollywood to do anything. And I, for one, would rather see Hollywood not give up entirely on adapting good literature in the future. In any event, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give the video a like. The channel subscribe. Whoa. Shit. Sorry about that. My light went dead right in the middle of a sentence. But as I was saying, if you liked this review, give the video a like. The channel subscribe. All that good stuff. If you want to talk more about movies, you can find me on Twitter at Colbrax. But I hope everyone has an amazing weekend. Thanks so much for watching this. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.